Let's go live with Jack Kelly. Welcome to the one of a kind LinkedIn live show that will help you with your job search and advancing your career. We will bring in educated career experts who will share their insights and give you inside tips on how to be successful in your job search. Now let's get into today's show with your host, Jack Kelly. Okay, now you're live. Now we're live. You know, yep. Now we're officially live. You're officially Christine yeah. gave the okay, we're officially live. I want to welcome Virginia Franco, the queen of the resume, the resume goddess, I think they call her. Let's, let's Everything. Not. She is the guru of resume, I understand, from what everyone is telling me on my due diligence. And I'm really excited to have you here because job seekers, and even people who aren't actively seeking a job, the resume is like one of those things that they just don't know what to do, how to navigate it, one page, two page. So I thought yeah. it'd be really super helpful if you were able to kind of just, just help people out with well, some, no. some of the burning questions. I would love that. Don't I, I won't accept the royalty titles, um, but I will say that I have been writing resumes since the day I got out of college. I just so like three years. Yeah, four right. or five years ago. Yeah, um, I didn't know that anyone did this for a living back then. I just did it for free, helping friends out. Um, so I do have a lot of experience. With long story short, so. that's what that's interesting. Why, like, right out of school? How, like, what made you? You know, when I graduated from college, people, it, my degrees in journalism, I've always written right. and it was a good job market. And so whenever friends and coworkers were looking for a promotion or something, they'd be like, oh, can you help me write this? And, you know, I use the same principles I learned back when, when I was first trained to write for the news to write theirs. And so I just always did it. And then in 2008, discovered that there actually is a whole industry that does this and realized that I could. But you were doing it so you were doing it consistently all through from yeah. graduate. Yeah, yep, since the twentieth century. So that's why. Did you did you go into journalism, or you just you said, "Hey, I'm just running with this. I'm going to be an entrepreneur." I did corporate communications, um, and then I did freelance writing, just a little bit of everything. Um, so I wanted to do journalism, but I didn't. My first offer was so low paying, I didn't want to move home, so I made a pivot based on yeah. that. So and then, and then, if you don't mind, so when did you decide just full time? This is it. I'm going to be a businesswoman and. Yep. So I hung my shingle out in 2008. I have four at the time. My husband's job had taken a hit with the financial crisis. Yeah. And I thought, what in the world can I do to bring in money and not drown in childcare? And that's when I did industry. Um, and so I started doing, I was always freelance writing, but I started to do more um, career writing. So. Wow. When yeah. you say career writing, mm -hmm. that's separate from resumes? No, it's, I, I, I bunch of all together. It's okay. career marketing collateral. So that was resumes and cover letters. And then it morphed into LinkedIn speakers, bios, like whatever you need to market yourself for job search and career advancement. That's what I write. That's great. And, and so, and I guess as things evolve, you kind of take on more, because yep. I imagine 2008, I mean, I, I think I was, I was most likely, yeah, I think I was on LinkedIn then as well, mm -hmm. but you didn't see as much action as you do now, right? If I no, recall. you know, yeah. Writing a LinkedIn profile back then was like a, just a quick cut and paste of your resume. Yeah. Um, it's evolved. Everything evolves. The resumes I wrote in 2008 that killed it then wouldn't today. Um, so we have to keep keep changing with the times with that. Now, do you find it also, in addition to LinkedIn, are there other social media platforms that would be helpful for job seekers that you, you would help coach them? Or is really LinkedIn is, is the big gorilla? So it depends on how comfortable people are with social media. Um, if you are really averse, then I say just, you know, pick one. And then LinkedIn is probably your best bet for getting started in terms of engagement. But um, I, I still am a fan of Twitter in terms of positioning you as a thought leader. You just got to be careful to post, you know, stuff that aligns with your brand and what you're interested in. Um, so because otherwise people will be left scratching their head. Um, same goes for Facebook. Um, it depends a lot on where your people are. You know, if you're in design, you might want to be on, uh, you know, on Instagram. So th the answer is it depends, but there's definitely other sites that I encourage people to engage with and engage on, um, depending on their comfort level with that, so. That's great. Now, would, I could ask you different questions about resume. Well, would you like to kind of maybe would you prefer just sharing, hey, what you're seeing now, what kind of trends, what people should do? Um, and we can do either. Um, well, I can comment really quickly on um, a trend that I'm seeing in yeah. terms of, um, and this has been morphing 
for the last three or four years, I'd say, and that's um, how people are reading these. And I'm not talking about applicant tracking software systems or ATS. I'm talking about just how eyeballs get on our documents right now. Um, people for resumes, people do print out but they don't tend to print documents until later down the road. So you need to count on those first few reads being on some sort of a screen, um, big screens and small screens. And we read differently online than we do in print. Um, LinkedIn is obviously exclusively online, but last I checked, I think it was like 57% of all users use mobile um, and small screen reading is, tough, is tougher than big screen reading. So you have to take that into account. Um, the good thing is, is the techniques you use to do that, you can apply to anything, whether you're writing an email or a PowerPoint deck or a presentation, so. You know what? I gotta tell you, maybe I'm a little naive. I really didn't give it, I, I didn't think that deeply about, you know, using your phone and mobile device. So what you're saying is that if, you know, you're putting your resume together, you're, you know, if you're a certain age like myself, you're still thinking in terms of printing it out and having right. the physical resume, right. but you know, getting past that, okay, now when you share it, it's not, especially with COVID, you're not going to an office handing it over and allowed to be on the phone. So that has to make it, I imagine that makes a big difference in terms of what, how you do, what does it make a difference how you do it? If it's not like, you know, a phone that's this big. Yeah, I mean, God help me if we start writing for Apple Watches, but right now <laughs> I just make sure that what I write can be sort of easily skimmed on your standard <coughs> phone. Um, luckily everything designed for that screen read conveys really well in print. It's just that the reverse isn't true. We have a really tough time online digesting dense text. So big fat paragraphs, five line paragraphs, and then bullets that are just all mushed together. It makes your eyes bleed. Um, that's why those, you know, when you go to iTunes and you see those agreement terms that you have to, yeah, yeah. all that mushed, mushed up small text is tough on your eye. And when someone's in a rush and something is hard to read, you run the risk that they're going to skip it. Um, so what you can do to overcome that is keep your paragraphs to two to three lines and add just a little bit of space. 0.5 points on Microsoft Word is enough space to let the bullet or the paragraph mm -hmm. sort of breathe. And it makes a world of difference. And you can still read it in print. Um, and denting, it's just like the stuff we learned in our, our in English in high school where you write in outline format. And denting is tough on the eye because on screens especially, we have a hard time reading left to right back and forth. Um, we tend to jump all over the page. So um, you need to write, you need to front load whatever you write. You need to left justify it. Um, what I mean by front loading is you put the most powerful part of whatever you're saying at the beginning of your sentences because, you know, there's no guarantee the reader's going to get to the end. Um, so just sort of things like that. Um, and, and the good thing is that how we read a, a news article online, a Twitter feed or a resume is the same way, same thing. So think about how you digest that stuff and it applies to your resumes. So would you, would you even suggest because I'm thinking through the lens if I'm, I'm putting your resume together, mm -hmm. maybe even a, a different version of your resume for when you know it's just going to be read on a phone. I don't know if there would be circumstances where you know someone's just going to read on the phone. That's the thing is you don't know because you people know, right? will pass it around and they very well likely will print it out later on. Yeah. So um, stick with the principles that work well for online reading and they'll, they'll print out beautifully just when you, you know, do the reverse that you can get in trouble. Would that also, would, so, but would that also mean you'd have less bullet points for each job because? So yeah, you can definitely have death by bullets. What I try to do is after, I've seen studies, but if you ask me where I found them, I can't remember anymore. But usually it's when you get to more than five bullets, mm -hmm. your eye goes, oh, too much to read. So what you can do is you can sort of break them down into right. subcategories. Um, so you could say like your sales bullets and your customer serve bullet, service bullets. So you, that allows you to have more under a job experience um, without hurting the eye. Um, the other thing that helps to minimize bullets is to focus on your achievements rather than a laundry list of what you did day in and day out. Um, those responsibilities aren't nearly, in my experience, as impactful as showing how, what were the outcomes of what you did day in and day out. So, so that's really interesting to do. Are there any other things like that that I think for most people, you just, just wouldn't think of? 
You know, you know what I mean? Like, I think most people have that just basic resume and not really uh, like even considering what, what you just brought up, even though once you bring it up, it seems so like obvious. So what I always say is sit down and ask yourself what with each role, how, what am I proud of? And how do I feel like I left your mark? And how can I show that? And so what you do is you think about, you know, what brought you, what was the challenge faced that you faced in mm -hmm. it? And then, you know, how do you know that you did a good job? And then what you do with those is you say, okay, this, I know I, let's say I'm in sales. I know I did a good job because my territory was at the bottom of the pack and now it's number two out of 30. Um, and I did that by, you know, coming up with a territory strategy and calling on customers. So what you're doing is you're sort of weaving your responsibilities into the achievement, if that makes sense. It does, Richie. So it's interesting. So for if I, th I like your example of a salesperson because that you could kind of quantify it. If my right. sales goals right. was X and I have two X, so I, you know, right. exceeded expectations. What if you are, for instance, I'll place a lot of compliance, legal risk, audit, mm -hmm. anti-money laundering, and it's hard to quantify because you're not bringing revenue, you know, right. you don't have sales goals. So how would, how would you do the accomplishments for someone who, you know, has like this white collar job? Yeah. That, and that you're right. Cause salespeople have it a little bit easier when it yeah, comes yeah. to quantifying. So with risk, you think about a lot of people, those people are facing auditors. Mm -hmm. So you think about, um, do you have a history of finding free audits when that can happen or proactive, um, uh, audit uh, response where the auditors didn't slap your hands. Um, if you're able to, a lot of times uh, people in those spaces are, have to develop processes to get, you know, to protect the company. And so you can talk about the process that I put in place, um, yeah. you know, used to take seven days and now it takes two, or um, I don't know if you're dealing with uh, like security, you know, data security, that kind of thing, but you could talk about um, assess, you know, identified a bunch of threats and now those are gone. Um, you have to be careful about what you yeah. put on LinkedIn because some of that stuff's proprietary, yeah, yeah. but you can certainly reference it, reference it in your resume with the numbers and then sort of allude to doing it on your LinkedIn. So that makes sense because really it sounds like what, what you're saying, Virginia, is that anybody can really dig down into what they do and find, hey, what are my accomplishments, what I've done? So even if it's, it, it, you can't, because what I, I think for myself and maybe a lot of, you know, the people who watch this and will listen to and watch it later, is that you're just thinking of, okay, there's some tangible thing, because a lot of times they're intangible. Like you said, hey, I, I, I you know, we had a regulatory uh, audit and we were successful and that was due in part, large part to my efforts. You know, you can't and pin a number on it. It wasn't successful, but, you know, so yeah. it's all the yeah. context. Um, everyone has achievements, um, and how you know? How do you know that you do did yeah. a good job? And there's quantify it. Sometimes the quantification is yeah. a little squishier, but it's there. And you also mentioned about a narrative. So I don't know if I'm if I'm not understanding right, but it seems like you're you're encouraging maybe more narrative form as opposed to here's you know bullet point one, bullet point two, bullet and just very bland. Here's what I did. Is that? Because each bullet tells a little mini story, and stories resonate. That's, that's your journalism background. You, remember. Right? Yeah, exactly. It that's that's where it's, it's telling a story. And your background is journalism too, right? No, it's not oh, at all. What? No. Oh well, gosh, I thought it was. Well, I you're just, a very good writer. Uh, thank you. I just fell into it. I mean, it's something, and you can appreciate this. You know, I just I started writing, and I enjoyed it, and I found out, man, I have a passion for it. And it's really cool, like later in life, to see you stumble on something that you enjoy. Yeah. Well. And, it's, uh, you're a very good writer. Um, I, I, I love writing, um, but the way you write for for newspaper articles and magazine articles is the same way you write for yourself in your marketing collateral. It's just really hard to write about yourself. And so I, I can see what you say. So you're, you're, it's almost like you're encouraging people to be their own journalist, to write, mm -hmm. to find like, here's my story, here's my narrative, here's what I'm doing. And do you think also that would make you stand out in a crowd? Because where, if everybody else is just Blah, 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 blah. I did this, I did this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. If somehow you inject a little, like, and how could you, how, like, how can you inject, you know, a little bit about who you are without making, you know, especially if, you, if you're applying to a very staid conservative company without them raising an eyebrow, like, wow, what are you doing? So the way you can do it, um, 
the one section in a resume and in LinkedIn that's really right. powerful is that summary section at the top. LinkedIn calls it the about section. Um, but there's no better way to connect the dots for the reader as to how you're a perfect fit than to align asking for together with little bits of detail about your career. So you might say, I, you know, the job posting says um, you need a history of, you know, 10 years of, I don't know, medical device sales or whatever. Um, then you could say, um, I have, you know, bottom ranked territories to the top at industry leaders, J and J, blah, 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 blah. So you're including a little bit of, you're listing some company names that you worked at. That's telling a little bit of your story and telling them that and aligning it with what they're asking for. And what that does is those little details help. It, it really does differentiate you from everyone else who instead is describing themselves with a lot of language that's gotten diluted where they'll say, you know, top track record for success. They just, they use a lot of really powerful adjectives that used to work great, but now they're so overused. They don't mean as much anymore. Yep. Um, right. Substitute the adjectives for right. details and you will, you're much more likely to connect your message to the reader. When the you reader. say the summary, uh, mm -hmm. that's that's for LinkedIn and your resume, or is that so? More? So LinkedIn is the about section, but right. the summary section is what you would put right after. So let me back up. Think I write these documents the same way you write for the news. So think about how you skim read a news article when you're in a rush. You look at the headline, and then you look at that paragraph that follows. Those two sections tell you what the story is going to be about and hopefully hook you to want to read more when you have more time. Imagine if a newspaper article skipped the headline and skipped that paragraph and then just jumped into the news story. You'd be, you'd probably skip it, right? So those two sections, when you put them into the resume and into LinkedIn, do the same thing for the reader. It sets the stage as to how you're a good fit and hooks the reader hopefully to want to read more. With the LinkedIn, you have more room to write that. It's a more conversational um, approach. The tone is very different, but you're doing the same things. You're showing the reader how you're a good fit by aligning what they've asked for together yeah. and weaving in stuff about your career that is unique to your story. You know, the way you describe it, it almost makes me feel that we would collectively be better off if it was really almost more summary and less bullet points from what you're saying. Like, I wonder if, if that would one day, how the resume would evolve, because I'm, more I'm thinking about it as a recruiter who looks at an awful lot of resumes, that narrative might be so much more helpful because you hear the story, you know, everyone likes to hear a story, it resonates, as opposed to like you said, just like, like I see so many that you put in a word salad of like corporate and, and jargon. And you're like, like what do you really I like do? that word salad? <laughs> like, what you know, I don't know. I mean, Tell I, me about I, yourself. I don't get maybe it. Maybe it's a combination. <clears throat> readers are in a rush. They don't have yeah. time to read your soliloquy of life. Um, so yeah. maybe you just need that paragraph. And then yeah. with your job, you say, here's five bullets that show how, what I'm claiming I can do at the top. Here's how I did it. So that's cool. So you put more time on the summary, which is really your story about who you are, what you're about, a narrative that hopefully drives it and hopefully it's, it's, you do it very authentically so that the reader's like, oh, all right, I get Virginia, I get Jack, who, who they are, what they've done, what they're about. And then there's less pressure when you throw the bullets, then you just hit really punchy bullet then you points. Back right? it up, you back it up with the bullets. That's your proof. Interesting. That's cool. <laughs> that's different though, right? I mean, I don't, because I read so many, res I can't, oh my God. I'll bet you've seen a thousand resumes, yeah. So um, the years. When saying that, there's a lot of people in our industry that have been oh championing this for a while, so. Yeah, that's because I, I, you know, I think for a hiring manager, that would make life so much easier if, if, if the structure was more like that, I think, right? And so, I think so, I've gotten good feedback for it, so yeah. So what is it? So I guess with the resume, it's just like a lot of things in life. You know, you have a format, it is what it is, and then you just stick to it. And it takes people like yourself sometimes to just take a step back and say, okay, let me modify it a little bit. Let, let, let's, let's, let's try to yeah. take it from a different angle, but not completely change it so it freaks people out, but enough that like say, okay, if you do it this way, you're kind of going to get more people to look at it, to read it, to respond to it, to be drawn right. to you, to want more, to learn more. The format has to evolve because yeah. as I said, people are reading differently. And this, you know, the way I wrote back in college is different and how you write for a new grad is different yeah. than how you write for a senior exec, so. Now what about with the cover letter? Because usually the cover letter would have that. Are you a fan of a cover letter? Yes no, or not? Well, or? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm a fan of them, but what I have yeah. seen, just 
I'm not a recruiter, I'm not an HR, but everything I have read and the people in my network yeah. when this has been discussed, it sounds like they get pitched, you know, anywhere from a third to a half of the time. Um, but when they get read, they can make a really big difference. So to me, there's no downside in writing it um, because it can make a huge difference. You just, you need to know that you can't count on it being read. Does that make sense? It does, it does. Because like for read, for cover letters, more often than that, I don't look at it, or if I do, I skim it really quickly to yeah. see, okay, hey, I'm in New York, but I want to relocate to San Francisco. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's not going to be on their resume, but now I know. That's great that you read them because a lot, I mean, a lot yeah. of people just go, I don't have time for that. So I, I, I kind of skim it just to see if there's something mm -hmm. that pops out, but you're right. But more, I would say eight or nine out of 10, it's just, it's really just not it's the key all of this not even our own mothers would read our documents with the fine tooth comb that we would love this is skim yeah. reading and then what do you feel here's some of the maybe i could integrate some of the questions people ask me okay you know you always see these new like online here's a new trend in the resume and you'll have you know teal colors and boxes where you put it in colored boxes and what have you is that a thing is it not a thing does it depend on the industry so I think it depends on the industry, yeah. um, but what I will say is that there are design elements you can use to help sort of draw the reader where you want them to go. Um, especially because on screens, we're on screens, we are ADD. We start at the top left corner, like we would in print, but our eyes jump all over the place, depending on what interests us. So, you know, bold is a design element, uh, using a color or shading, that's a design element. Um, I'm not a fan of graphics for graphics sake, but there's times when a quick chart might tell a story better than three bullets. So um, you still need that information in the bullets somehow because otherwise if you apply online software, it can't read picture, but sometimes I will use a picture. The other thing I say is that, um, you know, some, uh, the industries definitely matter. I, I don't see myself using a ton of graphics for a Wall Street resume. Yeah or a, an accounting resume, um, but marketing, I might. So um, the good thing about graphics is it's either easy to strip out. Um, but what I always say is if you, whatever your resume looks like, run it by a handful of people that you trust that are, that are hiring managers. And if everyone's always gonna have an opinion and you can't turn yourself into a pretzel trying to please everyone, right. but if three of five people say the same thing and they're like, I hate these graphics, right. I'm out. Uh, I, I like so, that advice too, right? Because sometimes you do something, it could be resume or anything, and you think, wow, this is great. And then you show it to someone and like, uh, yeah. and they spot all the glaring problems. Well, and right, you show it to someone right. else, like, okay, back to the drawing board. Right, or you'll get seven different pieces of advice and then yeah. it's conflicting. So try to gain <clears throat> consensus with your feedback. Um, and that's what I do with my clients. Go shop this around, get feedback. And if three or five people say the same thing, we're going to fix it. So I do find it's helpful too, if you give it to people who aren't in your space as well, so that if they're not in your space and they understand what it is, then it's like, okay, if they understand what it is, then I'm, I'm, I'm on good footing. Is that, yeah. is that part of it? Yeah, I think so. You know, it's interesting because you, you mentioned, if I'm looking away, it's just I'm looking to see if for comments that popping yeah. up. And uh, <clears throat> you mentioned about the ATS system. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something that it's like one of those things that freaks everybody out. It's like you hear, oh, these evil robots at the ATS, they're not, yeah. they're not letting my resume go through. Like, what's, what's the real deal? What's the real inside scoop? Is that the case? Is it not the case? So, I mean, ATS was designed to help HR to deal with the with an influx of applications. It organizes it and makes sure things don't get lost. Seems to me that it has become a roadblock, an unintended roadblock for a lot of people. Um, but the reason why for me is that, well, I mean, I don't, I never believe that people should use applying online as that first point of entry um, because of just how job search tends to work and, and people have much greater success finding out op about opportunities before the postings come out. Um, but ATS, there's uh, what, 300 systems, 283 different systems. They all work slightly different. So you have to, um, well, I write based on the generalities of how they tend to read our documents. Um, and the main things you have to keep in mind is um, if, you send, if you send it as a Microsoft Word document, it can't read anything in a header or a footer. If you send it in PDF, 
an issue. Um, if you have a, anything in a text box, a graphic, a, you know, a recommendation or, um, and that's why some of those Microsoft Word templates don't work so well because they are, um, you know, there's little boxes and you have to put stuff in. It can't always read that. Um, so again, PDF can overcome some of it, but not all of it. Um, so you just, oh, and then the other thing, again, this happens if you send in a Word document, but not PDF, but if let's say you have four or five jobs with the same company, if the system doesn't read the company name next to the job title each and every time, it might not give you credit for the work that you did, but ATS is getting smarter and better, thank the Lord. And so some of that isn't always the case. It depends on the system. Um, so um, I just, I, when I try to write, I try to write for the most uh, non-robust ATS, some of those older school ones and and make sure that everything's covered um, and then tell them send PDF if you can. Um, but if you can't take it, send the Word document and make sure you've taken into account all the wonky things that ATS can't do. Thanks. So it's really, it's just, it sounds like there's just a few things, as you mentioned, that could you know, be a little challenge with the ATS system, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the keywords and things like that. It's just more the formatting and that. Well, yeah, you know. I mean, keywords, keywords matter, but I've always felt like um, by the time the posting has come out, not always, but a lot of times, people have, there's already sort of a qualified pipeline of people in the running because it's human nature when a hiring manager has a posting to say, to say, hey, HR, let's get together and write this posting and get it out on Indeed and LinkedIn and all those places. But at the time, they are looking to see who they know, asking other people who they know. And so the buzz is out before and you've lost your window if you're waiting to apply online. Um, so the good thing is if you bypass applying online as your first point of entry, it doesn't matter if you have two keywords or 700, mm -hmm. you, you know, as long as you show you're a good fit, you're going to do well. Um, ATS isn't going to kick you out for that. It just maybe won't give you as much credit, but the scoring doesn't matter as much. So, so, so you're an advocate of it. And I agree with you wholeheartedly on it, especially in this market now where there's yeah. so many people in between jobs that if you're just going to go on indeed, and I'm not disparaging indeed, just, oh, yeah, just using yeah. this example, just you, words, yeah. you can go there find something, send your resume up, you know, do a long glitchy application. And it's so hard to get noticed. And it's not because of an ATS, whatever. It's just like you said, there's just so many, there's so many people looking at it there. They've already have probably isolated people, but yeah. I guess where you, it sounds like where, where you're going at with it is that, Hey, you want to be ahead of the curve and try to find people at the company to make sure you can get your, your resume to that right person or have that person get it to the right person. So you kind of almost like cut in line. Yeah, I mean, it, I've, I've said it before. It's like the fast pass at Disney World. It will really, <laughs> like that. It really helps. Yeah. Um, you know, but if you yeah. are, yeah. when you are applying, and I've always felt like spend 10% of your job search efforts doing that, and then 90% reverse engineering the process and say, okay, what are the companies I'm interested in? Who are the people I might know in those? You know, and then who do I need to know that might know people and having that discussion? When you are doing that 10% um, job posting or online posting stuff, you need to respond within the first two or three days or that window is completely, I, I feel like it's sort of a lost bet. Yeah, absolutely. It's because you're, you're fighting against it. You're right. Especially with a lot of these job boards, they stay on so long. So the time you see it and it comes across as new, it's not really new. It's right. been out and for that, a while. Yeah. And there's lots of reasons for that. And there's yeah. always outliers. I mean, so it's not, this isn't a hard sure. and fast rule, but I just feel like that's the best use of your time. And then I had something just, Another question that came in about what what are some of the common common mistakes that job seekers do on their resume that that and they didn't say this but that make you like uh, yeah so Arr. seven seven line paragraphs fifteen bullets all mushed together um, <laughs> they say that each bullet is a different responsibility that they had and um, and then the other thing that just drives me they will include a little some data or some um, numbers to back it up, but they stick it at the end of the sentence. Um, just put it at the beginning of the sentence because the reader might not ever get to the end. So well, they're, they're like, they're thinking they're being helpful because like, hey, look at all the stuff I've done. I've done and boom, 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 they have everything. Instead of actually helping their cause, it's just, you lose your audience. Is that what it is? They just yeah, can't- you can lose your, because this is a yeah. skim audience. Um, yeah. We have too many things competing for our time with reading, all of us do. So um, you have to think about how you read the news that top section better hook them 
And then you need, you know, that they're just going to spend just a few seconds diving through the beginning, the, you know, the, the document. So, so true. So if I'm writing an article and it could be like, you know, it could be really thoughtful, well-researched, but if I don't have a good title that hooks you and a good picture, it gets bypassed. It's the most frustrating it's the most frustrating thing in the world. It's like, if you don't have a cool picture that makes someone stop and a cool headline. Yeah, because we're all ADD. When it's, we're oh reading my online. God. And then, then, so they, yeah, you can change the headline based yeah. on what the reader, whatever you're targeting. You can't do that on LinkedIn, but you can do it on the resume. You know what? I'm glad you said that. So yeah. like, yeah, because I'm a big fan of telling people or advising people, don't have just one resume, send it out. Customize it for each job that you're going for, right? Absolutely. Is that something that- yeah, change that headline. If you want to be known, I don't know, let's say you do, um, I keep going back to sales. Let's say you're in sure. sales, but you or you want to do financial services, technology sales, that when you put that in your headline, then suddenly you have a niche and you're an expert in something. If you want to be more industry neutral and maybe you've done, I don't know, medical device and pharmaceutical sales, and you want to try to target both, you could say healthcare sales. Um, so there's just, just adding and subtracting words at that very beginning makes a huge difference. Cause like you said, the headline is what grabs you. Now, would you also suggest having, okay, so you have a core resume, but then would you also suggest, you mentioned the headline, having bullet points where you kind of move them around depending on the job you're doing and then maybe adding in and taking out. So, you know, it, it always depends, but what, what, the other thing I always keep in mind is that when people are reading bullets, especially on screens, they tend to look at the very first one. Mm -hmm. And then when they happen to have extra time, you think we go down to bullet number two, but actually <laughs> we jump down to the bottom bullet of that list. It's well, Oh, really? I never thought, yeah. really? Huh. You do top, bottom, middle. And yeah, huh. when you're looking at a bunch of columns, you do left or right, middle. So anyway, so with the bullets, if you are, if your target is different, then you might want to move a different top um, so that it's the first thing they see. That's, I never thought of it that because like yeah. when I look at a resume, I'll look at, okay, their first job, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. their current job, yeah, what yeah. they do and like the first two or three bullet points or whatever it is, lines in the, in the paragraph. So then I feel, okay, I have a sense that they do. Then I'll the jump first, the top part. Right? Yeah. And then I'll jump down to the next to job before that, just to see what they did there. And then I quickly skim everything else just to see. It's because I, I, it's really, to me, it's going to, because as a recruiter, when they come to me, they want to find someone who could do like exactly what they want, like everything. Well, so I want to make sure they have yeah, it. You just proved my point. I mean, you just read yeah. the first thing um, yeah. and because most people don't even bother with reading the bottom bullet unless they have extra time. And usually people yeah. don't have extra time. So. Yeah. But I do go to the second, at least the second job that they had, at, you know, I mean, before their current job, just to, just to see, was it progression in their right. career? You know, so the was, second job, but not necessarily the second bullet of that job. Right, right, right. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. well, I'll look at the first couple of bullets, but then I'm like, okay, I get it. And then my eyes will jump down to the job they had previously just to see, okay, what did they do? Did they, they move up? Did they flatline? Did just, and I'm not judging. I just want to understand and get, you know, get a sense of the person and their career trajectory and their career arc. So I'll kind of look at that. And then the rest, I kind of just skim I go <laughs> really quickly. And if I like it, if I like it, then I'll probably go to LinkedIn, check out, check out the person on LinkedIn, and then maybe do a deeper dive to see, okay, is this person you know, really good for the role? You and are know? you usually the first person that has, or do you have someone else on your team that's scanning them before you? It depends. It depends. Like right now, and I'll be very transparent, the area I'm in is a little slower and softer because, and this is not politics, just what it is, you know, with, with this administration, they're not a big fan of regulations. So these, and I, I specialize in Wall Street and these, you know, they're sharp people and they're like, ah, oh, I see what's going on here. We don't have to worry as much. So, <laughs> it's, so it slows down. So then, yeah, I have more time to, yeah. to look at it and all that. And then I find out a lot of people don't want to move because they're a little worried. If I have a job, I, I don't want to do anything. So, but then when turn back to just, you know, three, you know, before this, before this, oh my gosh, you know, just, just, just avalanches of resumes. The area is so blazing hot. Yeah. I would look at it, but you would have, you know, had two dozen people looking at resumes and nonstop right. because just so much. And so that, so the time you give to it, especially yeah. when you were busy is probably more than that initial screen. Yeah. that many more to look at so because they had a bigger pile and they whittled it down for you so yeah. how you read in the time you spent might have changed based on you know how many you had to look at so absolutely and how about this too like i have let's see 
I'll paraphrase the question. In terms of videos, because you start to see online a lot of these, uh, you know, having a video resume, mm -hmm. and is that taking traction? Do you think it will take traction? I mean, I sort of hope so. I'm all yeah. up for any forum that gets you, allows you to differentiate yourself. Um, I just think there's always going to be people that aren't comfortable with cameras. This yeah. is this Zoom culture that we've had to adopt is going to help that. Um, I don't know that I see them that breaking the mold in certain industries, um, but whether you have a video resume or or not, you do need to learn to be comfortable on camera because yeah. interviews are online. AI platforms like HireVue and those you know those, the the one way AI interviews are. I don't see them going anywhere either. So you got to learn how to navigate in front of the camera. I find that so cold, huh? To have that one way. You know, yeah. Right? So my my son's uh, in, he's a business major and all of his interviews with the banks were all that. And the good thing, I guess, is that you got to prepare for the interviews ahead of time. Um, and, then, and then people say that those softwares are designed to help remove bias from it, but it's hard because you're, you know, you're talking to a, to a I, circle and not a person. Um, I, I find it so like dehumanizing to do that. Yeah, but no, you know, ATS is dehumanizing too. Um, yeah. But I get, you know, I see the pros. I definitely see maybe some unanticipated cons, but I think it's here to say whether we like it or not. Did, did your son take your advice or would you give him advice? Uh, you know, his... some yes, some not, but he did get a job. So yay. I did, congratulations. But what's he, he doing? Look, he um, graduates this spring and then he has a job with a bank in their financial management analyst. It's like one of those programs where you oh, do- Oh, that's a great. Good so, yeah, for him. Yeah, yeah. That's so fantastic. He's Thank you. Did he do? Did he do like an internship there, or no? He just. Um, he did do. He got an internship, which was, you know, again going through that process of the camera, the the one way interviews, and then there were panel interviews. I mean, it was a lot of a lot of interview hoops. So he. Good for him because this market he, is tough. Right, so it so is. It's hard for these guys. Yeah. It's stressful. Hard. I did write his resume and his LinkedIn profile though. So. Did you? <laughs> yeah. well, that's what moms are for. Moms that's and dads, right? right? Yeah, to do yeah. that. I hope he appreciates it. Yeah. So. But he didn't. He didn't give you like a lot of pushback and like, no, this is this is not how we do it. You know. Um, he gave me pushback with the <laughs> interviewing because he felt like you could apply online to seven million jobs, and uh -huh. um, he learned very fast though that accessing connections and figuring out where he wanted to work and and doing the good old fashioned networking, he learned that that really did work. Um, but it's he's an introvert. He hates that stuff. So. He um, he's learned and he's embraced it and he's done tons of informational interviews and so I'm super proud of him for well that's great figuring that out early so that's awesome so then a couple of other questions one one thing too is that with gaps because of COVID or well there's gaps but then also COVID inspired gaps yeah there's gaps and gaps yeah what do you what do you suggest people do so if it's if it is a recent gap um, yes. COVID or childcare elder care, whatever the case may be, you need to call it out. The cover letter is a great place to call it out for sure and sort of talk through it, but explain what you've done during the gap. Um, whether you, and there, I have rarely come across someone that doesn't have something to show for their time away, whether they took a course on LinkedIn or they lent their, their skills to friends for free, or they volunteered or, um, while they were job searching. So whatever you can do to put that together in a in an entry, I, I support doing. Um, if the gap was earlier, you know, maybe two jobs ago, it's not as big a concern. Um, if you're concerned about sort of a couple of months gaps, that's an easy fix. You can, rather than listing your employment by month and year, just lop off the month and do the years. And that's a really good way to camouflage those earlier gaps. But absolutely call out what, you know, why you are not working, um, especially with COVID, you know, you can, it's easy to say uh, our industry took a, the industry took a downturn and our department was eliminated due to COVID. I mean, people get it, um, but do call it out because even though people get it now, they might not remember in two or three years, which sounds horrible, but I remember seeing that in 2008, you thought, oh, everyone's going to get it. It was a recession and, yeah. you know, it's people start to, things start Forget. to fade when things recover, yeah. yeah. So it seems like you want to, if there's a gap, and like I'll see people who maybe lost their job December, unrelated to COVID, let's say, just these things happen. 
And then all of a sudden, January, and they're like, okay, wait for the holidays because the holidays usually are slow periods for hiring. Then we, you know, get into January, like, all right, I'm ready to go. And then boom, <laughs> into COVID. So then they're out for a long period of time. I mean, and there are a lot, can I tell you, there are a lot of them. In fact, I just wrote about this recently, is that long-term unemployed, you know, 27 weeks or so, is, the, is like 3 million plus, like a huge a amount. And they're a having lot. a hard and time. Getting um, older people more. O older people Maybe as well. Older people are giving up even. There's, there's a yeah. lot of data saying that if you're 55 years and older and you've been out, a lot of them are just, just throwing in the towel because they don't know it's, what to do. Well, it's a shame. And I will, I'm here to tell you that my clients that are that age, I'm that age, um, they're interviewing. Um, and so the interview process I have seen, you know, obviously it depends on the industry, right. but I, I am seeing the interview process taking longer. I feel like there's more hoops. Oh, people, are, people are adding, I, I said it on a post the other day. It's like death by consensus. I feel like there's the same nervousness around making hiring decisions. That Absolutely. I saw back in 2000. Do you see that? Like in 2008 where they're oh like, God. let them talk to one more person. Let's, you know, all that's happening. Um, and so that part is frustrating, but there is interviewing going on. Um, and there is tiring going on. It's just, it's, it's just taking longer. Yeah. And then it's so really frustrating. People, so for those people who had those long-term gaps or even the short gaps, it sounds like you have to build a narrative so that it shows you are doing something. Even if it's, like you said, it could be volunteer work. It could be what have you, but you, you need to kind of show that somehow you're engaged, right? That you weren't yeah, just sitting home. Yeah. I mean, look, when my kids were little and I was drowning in diapers, I did not work a 40 hour week. Um, or I didn't get paid for what I wrote. So I, but I was always writing for free. I wrote mm -hmm. PR doc, you know, documents and bios for people. And just, I, and I lumped that all together as a freelance writing practice. And people didn't need to know if I did it for 10 hours every right, right. month or if it was 50 hours a week. Um, but I had some examples to show that I was keeping up with my skills. What would you say too, if you get a job that let's say in my world, let's say you're working for Morgan Stanley and you're VP of finance, like, you know, you, let's say your son's going to be there one day in a little bit, you know, he's going to get promoted really quick. He's a VP at there Morgan go, Stanley, yeah. but then, and then lost the job. It could be for any reason, not COVID, not COVID. And time goes on. Is it bad if you take a job because you just need a job? You know what I mean? And you have it on your resume, but I don't think so. Um, okay. Look, I mean, you want to pay the bills. I, I think that shows a lot of grit that you're willing to to do what it takes. Um, it's all about talking about what you did in that role and seeing. I, I work really hard to see if there are common threads that I can pull from that from that stopgap job that you took. Um, to show how they help you or, or help make you better suited for your target when you do finally get that. Next call. So, so you feel like, okay, even if you, you know, you're in a, you're long-term unemployed, you just need something and you're taking a lesser job, you know, there's an awkwardness to it. You know, you lose maybe a little self-esteem, but it makes sense to do it because at least you have something on there. You have something to show, show that you're being productive. You're making money. It shows, yeah, you get some money in, maybe healthcare, yeah. which is important too. So it's it's worth to take that, yes. that role. Because yeah. I get that a lot from people, Virginia, where they're like, hey, do I do that? Or I'm scared to do that because it's going to look really bad. And what are people going to think of me? I have worked with people that went and worked for ship, shipped, uh, you know, in those, or Uber. And yeah, um, they did that while they were also doing some certifications online to learn. Um, and we said that you, you know, continue to support your family while doing this. Um, and I mean, I wouldn't want to work for a company that didn't sort of respect that work ethic. And it's also a good tell, right? Because if let's say, you know, you were downsized, whether it's COVID related or not, mm -hmm. and you took a job to just do something, or you decided like yourself, hey, I'm going to do some writing, I'm going to do some volunteer work. And and if they just look askance at it, then you got to judge like, wow, do I want to work for you? Because you really are not very empathetic. And yeah, how it's yeah. going to be like if I work there that you're not going to really care about me as a human being. So it, Right. And it, regardless, it shows, yeah, it shows the gap, but it's all about seeing what skills that you learned. Um, so, and this is not someone that took a gap job, but I'm thinking about just someone who had to stay home to take care of um, yeah. an alien parent. And they're, they were targeting project management. And we talked through how 
talking with doctors and nurses and coming up with timelines for caretaking. We, I, you know, I just, I pulled, the, I referred to the skills that the person needed as project, you know, as a project manager, showed how they used them and showed how they applied to this next role. Um, yeah. And so there's, you know, it's, sometimes it's a stretch, but there, there are ways to do that. They're kind of related to it. I just saw, and I, I could be completely wrong with these numbers, so bear with me. But I, I believe I read that about 800,000 women pulled out of the market because yeah. of having to juggle so you know, childcare. Yeah, I know it's a lot. Crazy it's number. Lot. Like for them, what are you, like, is that the same thing? Like, what do you, you just say, hey, this is what happened. It's, and just tell the story of what, yeah, and what's I mean, going on. Some women can't afford to do that. I mean, yeah. so, yeah, I mean, you, Again, you talk about what you did during, if you needed, if you felt like the best thing for your family was to pull back because you needed to you know, focus on homeschooling or whatever, look, there's skills that you use as a homeschooler to, that you might be able to use for your next job. Um, yeah. And you need to, you spell out that, the, you know, that's an impact of COVID, so. Yeah. I think, I think, and you're right. I think a lot of these things, you could kind of judge the company, how they react to things like that. You know, if, if they just, Say nope, next. Then you, it's in a way, it's like okay, you might know not what? be the culture for you. Yeah. And that's you know, it's easy to say from the perspective of someone who is employed because people that yeah. are unemployed say, "I'll take anything." Yeah. Um, but there's always people that are jerks, companies that are jerks, but there's also people that are wonderful and companies that are wonderful. Um, so again, and that's why having that doing the outreach and the networking beforehand, you will get a sense for who those wonderful people are, who those great companies are um, beforehand. So you're not wasting your time with the bozos. You know what? And before, I mean, we, wow. They went quickly, like 45 minutes or so for, we didn't talk that much about LinkedIn. Do you have any, because to me as a recruiter, I probably look more closely at a LinkedIn profile than the, the resume at times. Mm -hmm. Because I feel it's a little bit warmer. I get to see the, the person. Tone, the tone is different. It's the chance for the reader to hear your voice. Yeah, and you do a lot of LinkedIn work, right? What would you suggest to people when it comes to the LinkedIn profile that you know really helps them and what hurts them? So first off, the biggest thing you can do to help yourself and the biggest thing that hurts you if you don't is when you make your headline be your default. When you when you sorry when you are creating your your experience. You're, you're entering in your job, there's a little box that says, make this job title be my on LinkedIn. Don't check that box because what you want your, you want your headline at the top of LinkedIn to include words that someone's gonna look, gonna type in when they are searching for someone who are in the kinds of roles that you're targeting. Um, Cause we've all seen companies where the, the titles don't make any sense for what they do or maybe they don't always have the right word. So like, for instance, I'll go back to pharma sales. Sometimes the role is account representative or pharma sales person. Um, so make sure that you have a customized headline. Um, LinkedIn's algorithm actually will weigh the keywords in that key section more heavily than it does other stuff in your LinkedIn. Um, the other thing that helps you on LinkedIn so that you bubble up to the tops of more searches is to fill out as many sections as you can. Don't leave things blank because um, that hurts your searchability as well. Um, make your about section conversational. Let the reader hear your voice. It's okay to use the word I in that, pair, in that section. Um, it shouldn't be a cut and paste of your resume because of that. Um, with the excuse me, with the about section, those first two or three lines of the about section, that's all someone sees um, and they have to want to click to read more. So make sure that those two pieces say, this is why this is why people hire me. You know, I fix hot messes, I turn around teams, I, whatever it is that people bring you in for time and time again, you know, I protect companies make sure that that's part of those first two sentences. Cause then the reader will go, Oh, let me click on more. Right, right. Um, and then with the experience section, um, you, you know, sometimes you can't always share revenue figures and stuff cause it's private companies and it's protected and all that, but you can still talk through, they brought me on to fix this. And this is what I did. Um, what else? And then you, the LinkedIn, you could have a little bit more of that 
free form as opposed to the resume yeah. that's a little yeah, more. I, yeah, I like to mix narrative with bullets on LinkedIn for sure. Um, and th But then remember the people are looking at this on a screen so don't have big fat paragraphs. Make sure to have space in between your paragraphs, all of that, because um, it just makes for an easier read. How about this? Can I go a few things by see if these, these, these are things that drive me crazy with the resume and LinkedIn as, as a recruiter. So how do you feel about it? With, with LinkedIn, when you don't have a photo, Number one, I, it just kind of was like, come on, why? What do you just, think when people don't have a photo? Just put it on there already. What you know? Oh. It, and then, or you have a photo, and then it's some dude having their arm around their yeah, you can talk about cropped out, and they know. cropped out. It's like, okay, we get it. Or you it's have a you girlfriend. circa two thousand and three. You know that, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, or you have, or, or this this is on a resume too. Resume and LinkedIn, the phone numbers don't work. Like you call or the phone numbers all you know fold up, so when you call, oh, you can't leave a message. Working. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you put on there that you check it. Yeah. That you answer your voicemail. Right. Um, and I'm, I mean, the good thing about the headshot stuff is if you can't afford, you can pay two or three hundred dollars for a headshot, but if that's not in your budget, there's really good iPhone software now. Um, my first picture, I've, I've told us back when. I went to the heart to uh, Home Depot and I stood in front of a white refrigerator and my teen <laughs> daughter fixed it with her iPhone. And you know, it's my one now is better, but it wasn't bad. So there's stuff that you can do, but don't crop out a picture of someone else. Um, make sure it looks like you now and not you back when. Um, there's a lot of that, I, right? There's yeah, a lot of that. yeah. And then you meet the person, you're like, wait, are you, is this the same person? If you don't have the picture, it just, it raises more flags than it doesn't. If, if you don't fill in the blanks for people, they're going to fill them in for you and they're going to get it wrong. So just put your, put your dang picture out yeah. there. Yeah. You know what too, I, as a recruiter, this don't laugh at me. What happens sometimes if I see a picture and they look like a nice, friendly person, I'm so much more excited to get and, and <laughs> no. call about a job because like, oh, this person looks nice and friendly. I, I yeah. can't wait to contact them. Where conversely, if you see someone and you're like, Ugh, I'll still call well, them. If you know, you well, photo feeler for your own. What's that? The photo feeler um, is a website and it's free for the first one. And then nothing you pay for afterwards. So basically you take your headshot and you stick it on their website and you crowdsource uh, responses. And then it, then it ranks it for like friendliness, professionalism. I forget what all else. Oh, all right. Cool. Um, yeah. It's photo feeler.com. Oh, cause I'll see so, sometimes people do that. And I, yeah. I didn't know it was from this. That's so probably okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I've done that for both all of them. So. How about this last pet peeve? I don't know if this bothers you too, where you have an email address that is just cringy mm -hmm. and they didn't change it. And you're like, what do you, what, like, you no, know? No. Yeah. So definitely make it, don't, don't let the, <laughs> don't let your email say something about you that you don't want. Right. Um, the good thing is that you can have a quick Gmail. It can be just for your job search, make it professional. Same with your phone number. If you don't want to share your phone number, go get a free Google voice number and forward it to yourself. Um, and it can be just for your job search. Um, you know, I know a lot of people with privacy worry about all that stuff, um, but it's, it's easy to do to set those things up and it, it, it's just all part of your image um, in your brand. And it, and it can make those little things make a difference. That's great. Well, you gave a lot of information. See, I wasn't wrong with saying the resume queen, I should have added LinkedIn too. So to have both okay. of those, right. but is there any last, piece of advice, you know, you'd like to share, or, or that was like, that's yeah. enough for people who are taking no, notes. I am a, it takes a village to job search. It is a rough process. Um, I, a woman on my podcast um, the other day was saying that just for women with advancement, people that surround themselves with other successful women tend to advance more. But the bottom line is, is when you have people around you, it's, will get you farther. So do not go at this alone, have people and have people in your corner that will, you need somebody that will let you vent and cry and have a pity party. You need someone that will kick you in the butt when time for the pity party to be over. And then you need some people that will, that are knowledgeable about this stuff. Um, because, you know, my mom, I don't want her advice from back when. You need, you need people that are currently hiring, currently in this process to weigh in. So that's, that's brilliant. Head, so. That's brilliant. I love that. That's a great way to end it. So, so Virginia, thank you so much. Virginia Franco, yeah, it's a pleasure. LinkedIn expert, resume writer expert, really awesome, super nice person. 
And what I'll do is cool with you. Well, we're, we recorded this, we'll post it as a podcast on social media. And then uh, this way people can ask you questions when it's, if you're okay with that, that yeah, let's say we post absolutely. on LinkedIn. Yeah. So that if they want, because I did get a lot of questions for people, I asked them beforehand to share it with me and then share it during it. So that's why I wasn't rude when I was looking yeah, away. No, I'm happy. I, and if I ever get stumped, um, there's yeah. a fabulous network of, of people yeah. on LinkedIn that do what I do. And because all of my strategy, everything I say is not, I didn't come up with it on my own. It's all based on- No, take credit for it. The people. Well, no, 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 take credit. It's based you... on feedback from recruiters like you and <laughs> HR people and hiring managers and other people that have been doing this forever, so- well, great. Well, well, you know what? Seriously, a really, that was really a lot of great advice. And I think the people who are watching it now and the people who will see it later on, they could learn a lot from it. I think there's a lot of stuff so that even you know, after doing this for 25 years, I'm like, huh, that makes sense. That's so interesting. I didn't think of that. So I, I think it's going to be illuminating for a lot of people. And I think they're going to learn a lot of things. And I think it might help crystallize what they need to do next, make, make them aware of things they haven't been done the right way, or maybe feel a little better that, oh, I was doing it this way. So I, I feel a little bit more confident now. So I think this was really helpful. This is one of the things I could tell you after doing this for so many years that people are just so, and you know this better than I, they're so stressed out about it. And the way you describe it so clearly, concisely, walking through it, I think I think this would be a big help for a lot of people. So I'm well, really super glad. Thank you for giving me this platform. Um, I My love pleasure. what you're doing because people need help. Yeah. They need a village, so. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing I'm doing with Recruiter now, Virginia. It's just like yeah. putting it out there just to help people. You know, we'll have yeah. we meetups to help people. Just like you're saying, the, exactly what you were pointing out. You need that tribe, that group of people to bring together folks, just sometimes just to commiserate yeah. about what's happening and get yep. ideas. So, so I think if enough people do that, because, you know, there's just so much negativity around. So if enough people try to do something positive and try to help, you know, we're all going to make a little bit of a difference. And I, I think yeah. you're going to help a lot of people. So thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. It was great meeting you. You too. Okay. Bye-bye.